Greetings, everybody, wherever you may be. Welcome again to Kuru, the home of Ariane, for our live broadcast of Ariane Space Flight Number 158. We're coming to you, as always, live from the Jupiter Mission Control Building, where the launcher and spacecraft teams are gearing up for launch of the Rosetta Comet Probe. You will be tonight with Mr. Pierre Junior and Mr. Pierre Collet for the French commentary. And it'll be my pleasure to provide the English language commentary. I'm Joshua Jampol. And you can follow our broadcast on our website, www.arianspace.com. We are pleased to be back with you for Ariane Space Flight number 158, take three. This very important and unique launch of an interplanetary scientific mission, the very first of its kind for an Ariane 5. The launcher, as you see, is on the pad. The clock is ticking. The panels are green. What could be better? Sit back and enjoy it. A lot has happened since last Thursday when we first uh, tried to go. Everyone here has been working very hard, all the teams. These people, the uh, Area and Space Flight Directorate, are no exception. Over to Jean-Yves Legal for more. <laughs> We're back together this morning for the final preparations to Ariane Space Flight number 158. As you know, we made two attempts last week. Thursday morning, everything was ready for launch when it appeared to us that the high altitude winds were too strong. In case of any difficulties during the flight, we did not have the guarantee that all safety conditions were met. We're particularly vigilant as regards these safety conditions, so we decide to stop launch operations and stop the countdown. We resume the countdown on Friday morning. Then, on Friday morning, during the final inspection, of the launcher on the pad, we observed an anomaly concerning the thermal protection on the big core central cryogenic stage. Immediately, Ariane Space decided to stop the filling operations. We brought the launch vehicle back to the final assembly building, where we worked Friday and Saturday to repair the thermal protection. We inspected the launcher from top to bottom to make sure there were no hidden difficulties. Then we brought it back to the launch pad on Sunday afternoon. Now the launcher is just here behind me. Operations are continuing and, if all goes well, we will fuel the launch vehicle to be ready for a launch attempt either at 8.17 a.m. or 8.37 a.m. European time. Ariane Space Chief Executive Jean-Yves Legal, the thermal cladding that Mr. Legal spoke of guarantees insulation of the very cold cryogenic or cryotechnic propellants from uh, uh, protecting them from the external environment. That's been taken care of, as he said, and we're ready to go. Up next, first highlights of today's mission. During the broadcast this evening, it'll be our pleasure to bring you news and special reports on the launch vehicle, the Ariane 5, and its mission. We'll also be hearing from the launch operations manager later on, who will report on the launcher campaign. We will give you details of the Rosetta preparation campaign and some insights into the 10-year Rosetta mission that will conclude with the orbiting of a comet on touchdown on its surface. Both events will be European and world first. Ariane Space Flight number 158 will lift off from the pad in just 17 minutes. Well, 15 minutes, actually. Ariane can fly all missions, as you know. We're doing something a little different tonight. Because of it, the broadcast is in two parts. This first part will be 35 minutes long. We'll take you down through final countdown to lift off over to plus 15 minutes after the liftoff. North and east, we're... We're launching east tonight, it's very clear, so we look to have a clear sky and a spectacular launch of the Ariane 5 in just a little more than a minute. You'll hear the DDO call out that one minute mark, and we'll be... A tous de DDO, attention pour H0, moins une minute.
Top page zero, moins une minute. We're into the final 60 seconds of this very ambitious Rosetta launch for Ariane Space and the European Space Agency. The final ignition sequence, you want to just brief you on that so we can be on the lookout for it. The main stage, the Vulcan 1 engine, will be ignited at H0. You'll hear the DDO call out to décollage or allumage, sorry. The computers then, what happens is, the computers will check out the pressure and the parameters for about seven seconds and uh, they'll give the orders to, igli to ignite the boosters at plus seven seconds, which is the point of no return, and then we will have liftoff. So we'll uh, let you watch that. You'll hear the DDO. You'll hear the DDO call out the final 10 seconds. Enjoy the liftoff, everybody. We'll be back. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Allumage Vulcan. Décollage. systems go, says the DDO. You saw Ariane 5 came roaring off the pad rather swiftly, too. She takes off at a good clip. She rose about 12 seconds and rolled over for, um, to get the, f to get the final, uh, the optimum trajectory go going east, also for better radar uh, reception. Lighting up the night sky over there. You see she's racing through the clouds now. On her way, sending Rosetta on her mission. The mass at liftoff, 750 tons. The core stage and the two boosters are burning now. Each booster, 238 tons of solid fuel. They will burn for two minutes, another 30 seconds roughly, burning two tons of fuel per second. You see all eyes that are watching the screens. Very focused here in Jupiter Mission Control. The boosters also supply 99.0% of the thrust. They give a boost for Ariane to leave the atmosphere. Without the boosters, the core stage is not enough to get Ariane off the ground. They also support Ariane 5 when she is sitting on the pad. The boosters very carefully built to be able to burn exactly symmetrically and give a parallel thrust for the launch vehicle. The EPC, the core stage, and the EPC. EAPs built by our friends at EADS, the Vulcan engine by SNECMA, and the EAP engines by Euro Propulsion. Coming up on uh, separation des étages d'accélération à poudre. As I was going to say, the DDO said at first, separation of the boosters, roughly looking like this. They're separated by these pyrotechnic cords, which push the boosters away from the the core stage, which is still burning. The boosters will fall into the Atlantic, some 500 kilometers from the coast. They are never reused. They're rarely recovered, sometimes for analysis purposes, but not tonight. All systems are go, coming up on three minutes. Next up, you'll hear the DDO call out the jettison of the fairing. The fairing stands 13 meters tall and weighs two tons. It protects the payload from pollution, dangers and heating up while it's waiting liftoff on the ground. Largage de la coiffe. And there goes the separation of the fairing. Again, separation systems using the pyrotechnic cords, separating the two halves of the fairing, two tons that we don't need. Now, they protect the satellite uh, from the elements in the atmosphere. The separation occurs uh, roughly 100 kilometers up, about 1,000 kilometers out. As I say, when the satellites no longer need the protection of the fairing, the 100-kilometer mark altitude is a general agreement on the part of the international astronomical community to distinguish between sky and space.